Hi there. I'm Reverend Jim Barklow, the Senior Associate Dean of Religious and Spiritual Life at the University of Southern California. Welcome, students and staff, to our exploration into Christian spiritual practices. Christianity is often viewed as a set of beliefs and doctrines, which surely are important aspects of the faith. But here, our focus is on the experiential. We'll be engaging in meditative and contemplative practices of Christianity that date back to the time of Jesus, practices that emerged from the different branches of the faith and are still followed today. Now, this exploration is for any Trojan, whether you identify as Christian or not. Here, you have the option of being a participant or an observer, and you can go back and forth between the two as you choose. While we will explore some of the historical background of these practices, this is not just an academic exploration. I'm an ordained United Church of Christ pastor, a progressive Christian tradition in Protestantism, which makes room for non-Christians to participate in all of our rituals and sacraments. So as I offer sacraments to you, I do so in my role as a pastor in my particular tradition. Now, if you belong to a Christian tradition or another religion or persuasion that sets boundaries around certain rites, uh, don't worry. If participation is inappropriate for you, just go ahead and be an observer. It could have been at the mouth of one of the shallow caves carved by nature out of the limestone cliffs of Mount Karantania. There, Jesus of Nazareth would have faced the palm oasis of Jericho on the Jordan River with the Dead Sea shimmering to the southeast. He started his ministry by going into deep contemplative prayer for 40 dawns in desert solitude. What awe filled his soul? To what inner and outer realities did he awaken? In silence, searching in and for himself, whom did he find? I invite you to join Jesus in the desert right now. A quiet place, a metaphorical desert, if not a real one, and get into a physical position in which your body will be comfortable, but you'll be unlikely to fall asleep. Sitting with your legs crossed and your tailbone slightly elevated on a little pillow is just one way to achieve this balance. Close your eyes and in the silence observe whatever arises to take your attention. The object of your observation can be anything at all. A thought, an idea, a sensation, something your body feels, something you hear, a memory, a storyline running in your mind, a scheme for the future. It can be an urge, a sense of needing or wanting to do something. Just watch the urge. Observe it. Let it be. Watch all that arises and passes, observing with non-judgmental, caring attention. Whatever arises, let it be. No need to change it right now. Be a quiet presence, like a friend who stays close in silence with a loving attitude toward you without giving judgment or advice. Put this video on pause and practice for about 15 minutes and then return. In the silence, sitting in the desert with Jesus, who were you? The observer or the personality and body consisting of the experiences that were observed? In my own contemplative practice, I reach a point where I identify, where I identify my true self as this inner, loving, accepting observer, rather than the features of my personality or my body or my thoughts or feelings that are observed. Meister Eckhart, a mystical German Catholic priest of the 14th century, once said, the eye with which I see God is the same 
with which God sees me. My eye and God's eye is one eye and one sight and one knowledge and one love. Teresa of Avila, the Spanish Christian, Christian mystical nun of the 16th century, advised her fellow sisters, mire que le mira, see that you are seen. Christian spiritual practice aims at this experience of spiritual union with the divine, seeing that we are seen with the same eye. The observer within you when you are deep in contemplative prayer is God. This divine seer directs loving attention toward your every sensation, urge, and thought. God is love, said the writer of the letter of 1 John in the Bible. God is the compassionate awareness of all that manifests within you and around you. Now this experience is at the heart of what is called Christian mysticism. Mysticism is not about mist, it's not about magic. Rather, it is the direct experience of God in the human soul. The mystics of the church are those who seek this experience through contemplative prayer. The literature they have left behind is vast and rich. Often when we think of Christian prayer, we assume that it consists of spoken words, of praise or supplication to God for ourselves or for interception, intercession on behalf of other people. These forms of prayer are important in Christian worship and personal piety. But in the mystical tradition of Christianity, spoken prayers are steps toward the unspoken, wordless, contemplative prayer in which the soul communes directly with God. Contemplative prayer is simple, but it's not easy. It's easy to think and feel habitually. It's difficult to stand back in prayer and observe those habits. When we see that we are seen, we realize that some habits serve neither ourselves nor others very well. This awareness is a confession of sin, and sin is the consequence of being unaware of divine love. The word for sin in the original Greek of the New Testament is hamartia, which literally means missing the mark. But in the instant that we see that we have missed the mark, the eye we share with God is back on the mark again. And contemplative prayer, confession, forgiveness, and reconciliation become one and the same. Contemplation shines a loving, accepting light on the murkiest realms of our inner worlds. And this can be unnerving. It can be disturbing to see things we'd rather not notice. But in prayer, we get both the diagnosis and the cure in the same moment of vision that we share with God. God is love. Love is attention. Attention even to the smallest of creatures. Attention to what is, as it is, on its own terms. Attention to existence itself. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin, yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. Jesus paid serious attention to things and to people that many folks in his day thought were insignificant. Birds, flowers, children, outcasts, women. To follow Jesus is to give the same gift of equal opportunity, attention. The Greek words for love in the Christian New Testament are eros, which uh, means romantic love, philia or filial love or friendship, family friendship, friends, and agape, unconditional love, love no matter what. In the letter of John, where it says God is love, the word for love in Greek is agape. Contemplative prayer is this specific kind of love. It is open, curious, engaged, inclined to enjoyment and delight, but willing to experience suffering as well as to commune with the suffering of others. It releases judgments and expectations and evaluations. It gently 
and appreciatively holds, whom or what is observed, without preconditions or assumptions or fixed definitions. What is as it is, it allows to be. It does not grasp or clutch. It affords freedom to whom and to what it attends. It is not focused on fixing things or changing people. Agape is God. Agape is prayer. Attention is the beginning of devotion, said the poet Mary Oliver. Prayer consists of attention, wrote Simone Weil, a Jewish-French philosopher who became a very important writer about Christianity. The mystics of Christianity, from the time of Jesus until today, have always understood contemplative prayer as a process. A 12th century Carthusian French monk, Guigo II, described the spiritual life as climbing a ladder. The steps were, in Latin, lectio, meditatio, oratio, and contemplatio. Oral reading, meditation, oral prayer, and contemplation. An ancient practice employed today in churches both Catholic and Protestant is called Lectio Divina, sacred reading. It follows the steps of Guigo's Ladder. It is about reading passages from the Bible in a way that lets them dwell in the heart. It's not about parsing some official theological meaning or, histor or historical uh, context out of the passage, but instead it is about directly experiencing it. The passage is read four times, each followed by a time of meditation. Then follows an oral prayer of petition to God in monasteries that would have been one of the eight daily prescribed offices or times of prayer, formal prayer. This is followed by contemplative prayer in which the focus is on attending directly with and to God. Contemplatio is the goal state of Christian prayer, present awareness of the union of one's soul with agape divine. So let's do it. Let's practice Lectio Divina. Uh, we'll shorten it in its time frame a bit and just do the reading and meditatio once, following the steps of Guigo's ladder. Lectio. I will read this passage from the Bible aloud from Mark chapter 4. Words of Jesus from his Sermon on the Mount. Release any interpretation or opinion you may have about this passage as you read it and hear it. With what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable will we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground, it is the smallest of all the seeds of the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs and puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. Let the passage sink in for two minutes in meditatio. Sit with the passage. Hold it lightly. Don't force any attempt to interpret it. Just focus on the words and whatever impressions they leave on your mind and soul. As one Christian mystic put it, meditatio is a time for meandering like a slow river that twists and turns as the water percolates into the ground below it. Pause this video for five minutes and then return. Oratio. This is the time when the monks and nuns would recite aloud the formal prayer for that time of day from the office or standard monastic prayer book. But here we'll just use a simple prayer, a spoken prayer. Lord Christ, may we receive from the scripture what our souls need for today. Contemplatio, the last rung of Guigo's ladder. 
Get into a physical position in which your body will be comfortable, but you'll be unlikely to fall asleep. The lotus position, sitting with legs crossed and the tailbone slightly elevated, is just one way to achieve this balance. As we did before, close your eyes and in silence observe whatever arises from your time of meditatio. Contemplatio begins with a sort of echo or aftertaste of meditatio. It's sort of the second derivative of meditatio. See what arises. It can be anything at all. It might seem trivial. It might seem profound. It does not matter. Just observe and let it be. It might be a thought, an idea, a sensation, a bodily sensation, something you hear, a memory, a plan for the future, an urge. Just watch. Take the time to observe the flow of these experiences, one fading into another. Watch all that arises and passes. Observing with deep, non-judgmental, caring attention, which is divine agape love. Do this for 10 minutes. We'll pause the video and then return. What came up for you in this Lectio Divina practice? What light, if any, shone through the Lectio reading? What sank down into you in Meditatio, and what bubbled back up in Contemplatio? You observed your thoughts, your body, your roles in the world, your ideas about yourself, but is the one who was being observed the same as the one who was observing? Who was doing the watching? The Christian answer to this question is God, who is the true self at the center of your being. To know the divine knower within you as you contemplate is to experience oneness with God. And this is the goal state of contemplatio. Lectio, the reading from scripture, is the mustard seed packed with potential meaning and significance. The mystics of the Church have always viewed the Bible as spiritual raw material with infinite possibilities for interpretation. Meditatio is planting the seed of Scripture into the moist earth of the soul and letting it take unconscious, invisible root. Oratio is the sunshine that invites it to bloom out into contemplatio, conscious communion of the soul with God. The parables of Jesus, like the parable of the mustard seed, are windows into his spiritual experience and can be portals for our own. Most of them appear to have been intended by Jesus to break open our hearts and minds. They don't have to have obvious punchlines or morals. So I suggest that you use them one parable at a time for your Lectio Divina practice. I recommend the uh, Revised, New Revised Standard Version of the Bible as a high, highly accurate and readable translation, easy to access online by Googling the words Jesus, Parables, and RSV. For me, walking prayer is central to my contemplative practice. I walk about three miles to a day, and as I do, I begin by silently naming what I see as I walk. A mountain, a tree, a bird, a flower, the sky, the wind. This gets me started down the path of present awareness and attention. Next, I unname my experiences by silently saying, my idea of a mountain, my idea of a tree, my idea of a bird, my idea of a flower. This encourages me in me an awareness that these experiences have a reality that cannot be contained by my names or categories for them. After a while, my sense of separation from these experiences falls away, and I sense their flow around and through me, filling me with deep delight. I begin to focus on the transient impressions and sensations of experience, 
rather than on physical objects that produce them. I notice the pressure of wind on my face and its sound rather than focusing on the wind itself. In contemplative prayer practice, I awaken to the reality that the observer of these experiences is not what I name as my body, personality, or identity. Rather, the one who sees with non-judgmental, agape-loving attention is the all-surrounding, ever-present, cosmic divine. Who or which is beyond naming? Traditional Jews never utter the holiest name of God, Yahweh. In the Bible, Yahweh is usually replaced by the word Lord, in Hebrew, Adonai. The Orthodox Jews often write God as G-D for the same reason, or they use the word Hashem in place of God, and Hashem simply means the name, the name of God they cannot utter. The divine name is too holy to speak or even to write. To name God is to claim some kind of control over God that we don't have. And in any case, the name Yahweh is in a way unspeakable. It consists of nothing but vowels. It's not a word, but a sigh. Sigh it with me. Yahweh. As St. Paul wrote, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Through this sigh, I attend to what is within, and that leads me to experience union with the Divine Beloved the divine lover within and all around me. Through this sigh, I attend to what is within. In contemplative Christianity, there are two basic paths to union with the love that is God, the via negativa and the via positiva. The via negativa, the negative way, is not negative really at all. It's rather the process of approaching God's presence by letting go of what gets in its way. The via positiva is the positive way, approaching God's presence by embracing its positive attributes or attractions. The via positiva amplifies small tastes of the presence of God into wider and richer experiences of divine love. The mystics of Christianity have approached God in both ways for the past 2,000 years, different paths up the same mountain. The Genesis story of the Bible says that what set human beings apart from the angels was our ability to give names to the creatures in God's creation. The unnameable God gave us the ability to name the things and the people we encountered. But to return to the unnameable God, whose presence is infused in all things that we have named, we have to let go of those names. We have to release our attachment to the names we've given our experiences and let them be what they are on their own terms, beyond our mental constructs and opinions about them, so that we can return to the divine source and essence that manifests through them. from the first book of Kings in the Hebrew Scriptures. The story of Elijah. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Now there was a great wind so strong that it was splitting mountains and breaking rocks in pieces before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake, and after the earthquake a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire a sound of sheer silence. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. There a voice came to him that said, 
What are you doing here, Elijah? The prophet Elijah in the Hebrew scripture story had to let go of all the nameable experiences that he associated with the holy and the sacred. One by one, in a via negativa, he had to let go of those words, those definitions and expectations, until all that was left was silence itself. In that wordless place, he met God. And so can you and I through contemplative practice.